Hey everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Alex Turner. Uh, I'm the program manager for the VB and C Sharp compilers at Microsoft. And uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about uh, here at Tech Days is, is async. Um, hopefully a lot of you guys got to see um, Bart Smet's talk on, uh, on how you can use async. Um, also, maybe you've seen other talks, maybe you've seen Anders talk about this, or us uh, talk about this in videos on the web, or you've gotten to try uh, the async CTP yourself. Uh, really what this talk is about is about how you get that sort of 400 level understanding of what's going on under the covers uh, with async, so you, specifically from a performance orientation. Uh, how do you figure out what's going on so you know uh, when you want to do certain kind of optimizations uh, beyond sort of the basic async code that you would write? So I just want to set some context so everyone can get the right benefit from this talk. Um, the people who benefit most are people who have seen async before. So either you've seen Bart's talk or you've seen Anders' talk. Um, if this would be your first exposure to async and await, um, we might be jumping in a bit too fast because we're going to assume that you've at least have some work on, on a working understanding of async. Uh, you're also somebody who's interested in low-level performance optimization. Um, somebody who may be a library writer um, or writes you know, components that are used elsewhere inside your organization. Uh, and you really care about squeezing the most out of that code. Um, the one core thing uh, that I hope you guys take away from this talk also is that uh, many of the tips here really don't apply at all when you're writing applications. Um, really, uh, you're going to hear me use this phrase, high traffic code, a lot during this talk. Uh, and it's really the idea that if you're running the code that's doing an async method you know, a handful of times, um, you're doing something in response to user events like users clicking buttons or typing characters, um, you're going to be limited enough that this will take microseconds, the difference between the different approaches here, and you'll never notice it. So really the place where you're going to care the most about this is you're implementing something that's sort of at the inner side of a loop. It's going to run tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. And we'll talk about the details there. Uh, you should also understand that this is all based on the shape of the uh, VS Developer Preview, um, the VS 11 build that we distributed um, around the build time frame. And so if you're playing with the async CTP today, um, these performance characteristics really don't apply there. They're, we weren't really concerned about perf. That was just about enabling things. Uh, most of the perf work we've done uh, to make perf work in that 99% case, that's all been done for uh, VS 11, and you'll see that in the developer preview. So if you really care about thinking about perf and exploring the perf, don't do that against the async CTP. Um, you'll just become very sad. So um, you guys are all still here, so that's good. Um, so really, we want to start with uh, getting on the same page around really the mental model about sync code versus async code. And you know, we all have this internal sense. We know that synchronous methods are cheap. I can pretty much guarantee that everybody in this room has written synchronous methods uh, in their life. That's what we do all day, right? And you know, that's what the world is optimized for. You know, you have, um, from the highest layer, you have languages that provide, you know, easy ways to compose with synchronous methods. You have libraries that often will assume um, that things are executing in sequential order. And you go all the way down to the hardware. Um, you know, you have processors and the things that they make efficient or the things over the years that have involved, you know, jumping into methods and, or jumping into, um, you know, function calls and actually being able to do that and pop, uh, push things onto the stack, pop data off, all the stuff is optimized to make synchronous method calls um, super efficient all the way out um, through the entire stack. And, you know, it gives you flexibility and productivity as a developer, too. You look at some simple method like this, so simple body. All I'm doing here is I'm saying console.writeline, hello async world. If I look at the IL that would be needed to implement this, you know, this is pretty simple. It's exactly what you'd expect. Load up that uh, hello async world onto the stack, call console.writeline, and return back to our caller. Pretty simple. Um, we're going to kind of use IL and sort of length of IL as a proxy for complexity during this talk. Now, generally, especially when you're going to have calls to things like console.writeline, even console.writeline is doing IO, 
Um, it's not necessarily going to be this you know, perfect uh, proxy, but you'll sort of get a sense for what's short uh, and what's longer. So, I mean, this is what we'd expect. This is short. It itself is building on other synchronous methods like console.writeLine. This world makes sense to us. And, you know, from what you've seen of async, the whole benefit of async is that you get to write code that at the, the user layer, the developer layer, when you're writing this, this looks just as simple, right? All I've done here uh, is replace void with async task. Uh, I haven't added any actual asynchrony. I'm not awaiting anything inside this method. Uh, but it's now going to generate a task. It's going to participate um, in that whole scheme, make a task, return it to my caller. He can track using that task to know when this method completes. Um, but you know, we're going to return it uh, at the end anyway. But you're going to see what this actually builds, right? So this is now the IL that you get uh, for this simple body method. And you can see it's a lot more complicated. Don't worry about trying to read this. It's pretty small. Um, but you know, if you actually are close enough to read it, you might be sort of scanning it. And you're going to notice there's nowhere in here that you actually see a call to console.writeLine among this code. And so not only is this code longer, there's attributes involved, there's more stuff going on, um, but we're actually uh, doing this, uh, or breaking this method apart into multiple methods, this kickoff method, uh, and then also the state machine. Uh, if you've heard us describe how async works, you've probably heard us talk about the async state machine. Uh, that's where your method sort of gets split up at the await points. You have uh, the returns that happen at each of those points. You sort of come back in. You're going to jump to where you left off. That's how you can pause and resume your async methods. It's transformed that way. Uh, and what you see here, um, you see this call to move next, right? So this is on that state machine object, that sort of mangled simple body name that's there to the left. That's the class that's generated to represent this state machine. Um, you know, and we're calling move next on it to kick it off here. So if you then take a look at what's involved in that class that's generated, you know, now you have like a whole lot more code, right? And if you take a look, we still have that console write line, the three lines, you know, logically in there. We're loading the string, calling console write line, and sort of logically returning there. Um, but it's around all this async uh, boilerplate, the stuff that's necessary to actually let your method be uh, you know, paused and resumed and picked up where it left off. So you know, this is obviously a very small example, but you can see uh, the size of the overhead that you're kind of dealing with here. Uh, and you know, we're talking about just amount of code, but there's also kinds of things that you see here that are just not present in your original method. One of these is a try-catch. Region. So you see in the IL we're declaring this try. Uh, that's because you know, normally in the COR, exceptions just surface naturally. Um, here, we're creating this point of asynchrony. And so if an exception surfaces out of console.writeLine, we need to capture it, and we need to be able to set it into the uh, task that we're returning to have that be the exception that that task is going to return. So you know we have that. You see down here we're calling async task method builder dot set result. Even you know once we're done and we want to set the task to completed, that's calling into more code that's not listed here. That's framework code, um, but it's further things that are going on that are part of the infrastructure. So you know just to get a sense of this kind of sync versus async overhead, uh, let's go in and we'll take a look uh, at a perf uh, comparison here. So um, what we got here, um, this is just a simple console app. I'm going to be moving through different demos um, as we go here, as we talk about different stuff. And the slides, we're going to dig in and actually explore the perf inside VS so we can get a sense. Uh, the first one we're doing here is empty body overhead. Uh, and when we look in here, we see there's two methods here. Um, I'm defining empty body. This is standard static void method, uh, nothing fancy. And we're making an async void method. Um, so you know, both of them don't have any actual body. They're not doing anything. But one of these is going to get the default async um, you know, boilerplate around it, the async overhead. And that's all it's going to have. And so you see, we're going to use this kind of pattern a lot. We're doing these perf tests uh, throughout. Um, the pattern is we're going to set up um, see our stopwatch object to do the perf analysis. Uh, we're going to do this a certain number of times. In this case, we're going to run this test 10 million times. And we're going to you know, see how it works across that and uh, doing both of them 10 million times. And you know, we're going to first run each of the methods once in case there's any startup cost, things need to be jitted. And we're just going to get that out of the way. Uh, and then once we've run it, uh, ran it once to prime the pump, 
uh, we're going to go through and you know, restart the stopwatch, do the perf test. In this case, we're calling empty body. Down here, we're calling empty body async. And in each case, we keep the timer. So this is the pattern you're going to see as we go throughout today. So if we actually go and run this, uh, we can see that in the async case, um, to do this 10 million times, it took one second. Uh, but in the synchronous case, to run this empty method body one million times, it took three hundredths of a second. Um, and so, you know, this is, again, just the pure overhead. Um, you know, at, at this point, uh, the way things are in the COR, you can see that calling synchronous methods has been very heavily optimized. Uh, and we've done a lot of optimizations to ensure that delegate invocations and a lot of the things in the COR that form the foundation of uh, the asynchronous uh, work that we're doing, those things are fast, too. Um, but there just is this inherent overhead to managing this resumability uh, that's surfacing here. Right. So, I mean, and again, the one thing to remember here is that this is this kind of, you know, micro uh, benchmark that we're doing. This is an empty method. Once you start to get logic in your method, this thing could start to balance out. But, you know, it, it, it takes a bit before it becomes um, completely something you could ignore. Let's actually take a look at what you'd have to do. If I go into my... Uh, synchronous empty body method, and let's say right, for int i equals uh, zero, let's say like i is less than 200, uh, and then we'll add something here. So we're just adding sort of this fake loop. It's going to go from you know, zero to 200. We'll run this again. We're only going to do that in the synchronous case. And so you see now it's sort of about equal, right? I can run it again and see you know, it's about 1.2, 1.2. So that's, that's about what it, uh, the perf results are coming back. So, you know, it's approximately equal to the overhead in the async case uh, to having this 200 iteration loop in my synchronous case. You can imagine that's about how much uh, overhead is going on in my machine. So, you know, that if you have a reasonably complex method, then it could dwarf uh, the stuff going on here. But this should hopefully give you pause when deciding exactly how coarse you want to make uh, these kind of methods, right? Uh, if you're doing reasonable logic, if a lot of the time it's actually going to be purely asynchronous because you're going to come back and you know, make a network call and that delay is going to be the bulk of your work, then you don't have to think about this, right? And that's going to be the case for a lot of applications that you're writing. Um, but one thing we're going to see is that for a lot of library code that you might write, uh, a lot of times these things are going to start to complete synchronously. And in that case, you can easily and very quickly get through 10,000, 100,000, a million awaits. Um, and at that point, that's when the, uh, the delays here can start to add up. So let's go back to the slides. I mean, you take a look at async methods, right? Where does the cost come from? Well, we saw in the IL where some of the cost comes from. Async methods are wrapped in a try-catch. They need to redirect exceptions that happen so they don't blow up the app there, that the exceptions can resurface wherever that task happens to be awaited. Uh, they have multiple calls into these framework helpers, things like you know, async task method builder, set result. Uh, these are doing you know, some non-trivial work to just make the tasks actually work as you want them to. Um, and as we'll see in a bit, uh, async methods end up accessing uh, fields uh, out in the heap where a standard method would access locals. Your locals get sort of promoted into the heap so they can persist across pausing and resuming. Um, and just generally in the COR, it's a bit slower to access fields than it is to access locals. That's another reason it can be slow. So, you know, when we think about async methods, these are methods that just generally have more overhead than sync methods, right? And when we get into this kind of high traffic code, it starts to become uh, more important. So we need to have this new mental model. Um, you know, it's not the case that if we have any method, uh, we can always just split it off and create a helper method at zero cost, uh, right? You know, in synchronous code, you can usually think that way today. Um, if I have this, these two lines and I find they're occurring all over the place, maybe I'll start to pull this out uh, into a helper method, and I'll just do it all, like a lot, right? And you assume the compiler is going to handle this kind of stuff for you. You have things like code inlining. Uh, if the COR JIT notices that you're going to have um, calls to this method uh, in places where you could easily just inline a few lines in, it'll do that for you. And it's as if you wrote it there. And at that point, then calling the method has absolutely no cost. Um, but for async, there's enough complexity that we can't do that inlining. Um, so really, the core thing to think about here is to pay attention and ensure that you're going to the right level of granularity 
with your async methods that you want. Um, make sure that you're planning to do some reasonable amount of work in an async method, that you're going to download a sizable string, or you're going to process some you know, large amount of data. Uh, we actually had more of these kind of async BCL APIs that we were exposing along with the async model. And you know, we had some of these that were operating in very fine-grained nodes. They were dealing with you know, individual bytes, potentially. Um, and at that point, all the overhead dwarfs the benefit. And so we made little subtle changes in the APIs we exposed that really kind of encourage this, uh, encourage this more chunky, this more chatty interaction, or versus a more chatty interaction uh, with the object model. Uh, and so you're really encouraged to take a big chunk of data, pull it in, and then synchronously operate on it. Uh, this is one of the reasons that, um, you know, among syntax concerns, that you don't see async properties, for example. Um, the model we want to encourage is that maybe you'll do one heavy lifting operation that's going to pull in some data, but it should pull that data in and then fill some sort of in-memory structure, and then you should be able to synchronously evaluate the properties to get what you need. And if you need some next level of data, you call some method that'll fill some uh, further object. So the one thing, though, that's very critical to understand is that uh, these concerns we're talking about with async overhead, they're not specific to the async language feature. They're actually just specific to the idea of tracking delegates, of figuring out what to do on completion and all that. Um, if you're doing any kind of asynchrony today, if you're talking about begin-end methods, if you're using something like web client and you're calling download string and you're signing up for a completed event, these are the different async patterns we have. And with those sort of manual solutions to async, you have either similar overhead um, or you actually end up with less overhead by using async methods. So you know, it's not that async methods are introducing this, and in fact, they can often uh, do this kind of overhead in a far more efficient way than you could yourself by leveraging certain CLR tricks. Um, but it's really just when thinking in this async mode, you want to be deliberate about where you choose to apply asynchrony. Uh, async methods can make it very tempting to overuse asynchrony and to make very granular methods, right? If you got to the point where you, know, you had one method and it was doing one operation and calling another method and doing another operation and calling a method, that might be a case where you should squish those together, even though you could get away with that with synchronous methods. Um, but again, remember this is for this idea of high traffic code. Um, if you're just going to download a string and process it and do another thing and you have four async operations, it's the difference between you know, 100 nanoseconds and 2 nanoseconds or something, and no one's going to actually notice that. So this talk is really to help you get that sense of the cases where you have to think about this more explicitly. So no .NET performance talk is complete without a discussion of garbage collection. Uh, and there's, this is going to introduce some themes that we see coming up as we talk about uh, some of the performance issues you can see in these high traffic uh, async methods. So, you know, generally, .NET is managed. Uh, managed memory involves uh, this idea of garbage collection. Uh, and the management, you know, isn't free. Like, allocating objects has this kind of cost that you have to pay. And it's, you know, kind of a sneaky cost. It's not. Uh, a cost that you pay right away. The act of actually allocating an object is extremely cheap. Uh, that's not where you pay. You pay ultimately when you've accumulated enough garbage that you then have to go and do a garbage collection cycle. This could pause your app. You know, depending on how much garbage there is to collect, you can have noticeable blips. Your app can become unresponsive. So the GC is when you actually pay for the garbage that you're producing. And so the GC is controlled, there's heuristics about when it runs, uh, and it's going to you know, sort of patrol the set of active objects, dig through, and try to figure out which objects aren't used, which ones it can collect. The more such objects you have, and the, more you're, the faster you're accumulating them, um, the more GCs you're going to have. When the GCs run, if there's a huge object graph to navigate, it's going to take longer to actually do enough digging to find the objects to get rid of. So having more objects that are not uh, necessary is going to increase this GC memory pressure and cause more GCs. Just having bigger objects also causes more GC. Uh, if you're allocating you know, 15 byte objects versus allocating 1K objects, the 1K objects are going to obviously fill up your memory faster, cause memory pressure, and force the GC to run a lot more often to clear those out. And allocations can be sneaky in this way because they have this global effect. right? And so in one part of your app, maybe you're tracking objects more closely, but uh, one part over here that's creating objects uh, rapidly is 
accumulating objects in the same memory space and can end up causing issues over here with performance. So you do have to be concerned throughout your app. So if we think about ways that we can you know, interact with the garbage collector and help out our, our, our performance, you really want to do two kinds of things. And these are the, the themes that we're going to see pervade the rest of the talk. Uh, one of them is just simply about avoiding unnecessary allocations altogether. So you know, if there's an allocation we can eliminate in the heap, if we can keep something on the stack, uh, that's something where uh, you know, we don't have GC pressure that's accumulating, because the stack is easy to clear. Uh, we also, when we actually do have to put something in the heap, we want to keep that, that object as small as possible. And so we also want to avoid bloating objects. So these two things together are going to be sort of the key to seeing how we reclaim a lot of the asynchronous perf. So you know, when we look at where you would get allocations uh, through async methods, uh, just the idea of managing these tasks and managing the infrastructure around it, you get a set of uh, allocations that are sort of intrinsic to that. So the way that we have the async feature designed, we have this state machine. It's core to the design of async. And you know, the state machine has certain uh, state that it's got to track. Um, one of those is you know, obviously the current state where you are. So every time you're pausing and you have to resume, we have to record where you were in the state machine so we know where to put you back. Um, we have to hold on to this async task method builder. That's a struct, so it's OK, but we'll see about that in a sec. Um, you know, there's also this move next delegate. We'll see why that's uh, important in a bit. Um, you know, and you know, there's move, move next method. So the size of this is, you know, potentially reasonable. But remember that those locals are going to start to get promoted into here, and this size could start to bloat. So this has to be allocated off in the heap somewhere. Um, you know, now this move next delegate. Um, we need something to pass to this on-completed method. Part of the design of async is this ability for you to await anything that has a getAwaiter method. And part of the getAwaiter pattern is some object says, hey, I'm awaitable, I have a getAwaiter method. The object you get back from that supports various things, including on-completed. And on-completed is how us as an async method, we're able to await anything. We say, hey, whatever you are, when you're done, here's uh, a delegate that points back to me and says, when you complete, you call me, and that's going to resume. Um, that, that's going to continue my, my moving next through the state machine, right? So this delegate that's created is handed off, and that's how people call back to us. And delegates are things that we have to go allocate on the heap. The other thing that we have is this handle to a task. Task is a class, so that has to be allocated in the heap. Um, you know, so you, you see back up there, async task method builder, that's a struct. So all the details in there, those are stored uh, wherever you know, the uh, simple body of the state machine is stored. It's stored baked into there. Um, but the task itself has to be a, an object in the heap. It is a class. Um, and we can't change what task is now, because we have the existing type there. It's there from .NET 4.0. Uh, and so we have to be able to store those objects, and that's going to have to go off into the heap. The task method builder has to keep track of that. It has to be able to say, hey, when my async method completes, go set that task to be completed. Uh, and marking that completed is what triggers whoever's awaiting that task to go continue their own logic. So we have these three allocations we sort of can't escape. You know, in some ways, we're going to have to store this. Uh, and then if things are actually asynchronous, um, these are three things we're just going to have to allocate. So what saves us here? How can you actually write, uh, perform an asynchronous code? Well, the key is that um, asynchronous methods start out running synchronously. If you'll remember, when you enter an async method, you're still running synchronously on top of your caller. If you were to look at the call stack, you're stepping through that method, and your caller is still there. It's only when you get to the first await that it itself is going to go off and do a network request or something delayed that stepping over that puts you Wait out, waits, returns to your caller. And then when you come back, now you're in an async callback. right? So up to that first await, that first asynchronous await, you're still synchronous on top of your caller. And there's many asynchronous methods that start running synchronously and may actually complete synchronously. And this is part of this idea of an await fast path. Um, so we'll talk about some scenarios. But to take a look here, um, so I'm saying here, await foo async. And I'm assigning this to a variable of type t result. So what does this actually expand to? We can see on the right, that's the C-sharp pseudocode that the compiler uses that it expands out to. So you know, obviously, we're calling this getAwaiter method. We're getting the awaitable. Or we have the awaitable. We're getting the awaiter. 
Um, and you see, though, that the first thing that happens is we check the awaiter to say, is this object already completed? You know, is this a thing that's already done? For like, example, you look at foo async. This could represent file I.O. You know, file I.O. is something we make async because you could be doing file I.O. over a network. Um, you know, it could be over a slow disk, it could be to a tape drive, who knows what it is, right? Um, so that has to be asynchronous just in case it takes a while. But you could very well be loading some small 1K file off your own hard disk that the OS has already cached in the I.O. cache. In that case, the act of trying to go read that file, the OS is going to say, hey, I already have this data, here it is. Uh, and so it's not going to want to deal with all the overhead of doing callbacks and all that. It's just going to directly hand you the data. So, you know, when you have that kind of underlying layer, you don't want to be introducing the asynchrony. You want to directly return. And so let's say FooAsync got one of those things. We get the awaiter. We come back. We say, hey, is it completed? And we'd say, actually, it is. We already have the data, in which case we're able to jump immediately to getting the result. Uh, it's only in the case where we don't have the data that we then go through all the pausing and resuming. You see, we save our state. This is about persisting our locals out, um, out and, and doing this safely. Calling on completed, we're registering this delegate that we keep track of to let uh, the thing we're awaiting call back into us and resume us where we left off. And then we actually return. We go back to our caller, we get off the call stack, and we help free up the thread. Later on, 10 seconds later, the completion delegate fires. Its job is to get back here and jump back to that label. And then we restore the state and we continue. And only at that point do we actually say, hey, let's go get the result from the awaiter, because it's now finally done. So this ability to have an async method that completes synchronously is the key uh, to getting perf. Um, and doing so enables certain compiler and framework optimizations that help to eliminate those allocations we saw on the previous slide. So one of them is, well, if we have something that completes synchronously, we never actually have to put that state machine out into the heap. And so what the compiler does is it'll start off, that state machine, it'll start off as a value type. We actually don't emit class state machines, we emit struct state machines. And the idea is we keep it on the stack. It's local there. We're manipulating it as you change locals within your method. Uh, you're going ahead and changing the locals that are there on the stack. And then only when we get to this await, we realize we're going to have to go be asynchronous because we're waiting for a network operation or something. Then we actually box that out into the heap. Now it's in the heap. Uh, we can track it. It can persist even after this call stack goes away. So we're able to do that only in the case where the awaiter didn't complete synchronously. We're also able to delay allocate the completion delegate. You see here that we're passing completion delegate to oncompleted, but if we never go into that branch of the if, we never actually needed the delegate. So the compiler's code gen doesn't actually create it until the point where it needs it. That way, that's another allocation we can avoid in that synchronous fast path when the if block doesn't execute. So in that case, we've eliminated two of our three allocations. So the way you can eliminate that last allocation, which is the task your method is returning, is a bit trickier. Um, you know, it would seem like this one is the one that kind of makes us stuck, right? Like, we have to return a task. The contract of our method is someone calls us, we give them a task. Even if we're already completed, we have to have that task to give them. But there's a lot of cases where we can actually cache such tasks. Uh, and this is a way that we can actually squeeze out that one last allocation there. So, you know, the, the takeaway here is that many asynchronous methods will actually complete synchronously, and that's something that we and you um, are going to care about in terms of squeezing out perf in these high-traffic methods. Um, you know, allocations are still going to occur for tasks, even if we um, do all those synchronous tricks we talked about. You know, in general, the task is going to need to be allocated. You have to give it back to your caller. It represents the particular result you had. It has whatever number you returned, object you returned, or so on. But we actually can cache some of these tasks. And you take a look at the tasks the framework does cache. Uh, one of them, look on the left, we just have the non-generic task case. This is the one where my async method is only signaling completion. It doesn't actually return a logical result. It just says, here's a task. I'll tell you when I'm done. Uh, in that case, if that method doesn't yield and it returns synchronously, the only thing it's saying to its caller is, hey, the first time you check, I'm already done. And a task that's completed is equivalent to any other task that's completed. There's no other state there. It just is a task that says, I'm done, when you ask it. 
So what we actually make and we pre-cache is a I'm completed task. Um, and so if you call a method, if it doesn't yield and you get to the return, you get to the point where the very first time you're returning the task, it's already done. We just give you our singleton task that says I'm already done. Uh, and it never has to change state. So you think of a, a place where 99% of the time things are already going to be done and you maybe you only care about completion. This means that you're avoiding allocating 99 of those 100 tasks. The other cases that we have are cases where we have um, a small number of tasks, task of bool, for example. Um, there's only two tasks that could be returned there, a uh, task of true and a task of false. Right? And so in the same case, if we don't yield, we already have a true and a false cat task that we'll just cache. And we find that a lot of the high-performance APIs that people will write that use async uh, will actually modify some other structure and simply return true or false to indicate some condition. Um, and this lets that be as fast as returning um, just non-generic task and signaling completion. The other thing is if you're going to return an object, maybe most of the time you don't return an object and only sometimes you actually have an object there. Well, we wouldn't want to cache all your objects for you that could keep everything alive, but we can cache the task for any given type that uh, returns null. So if your async method is returning null and this, again it doesn't yield, we can cache that task and return it. Now, again, the, we wouldn't want to do any further caching. There's this limited set of cases where we know we're not going to keep reference objects alive in the heap. You know, true and false are not things you can keep alive, right? Um, and null is not a value we have to worry about. Um, but we wouldn't want to cache your objects. We don't know enough about the lifetime semantics you want to know whether it's appropriate for us to keep your objects alive. But if you happen to know, based on your domain, that it's appropriate to go further and actually cache those tasks, you can do so and basically eliminate that final allocation yourself. So one way to think about this, or one good example to think about, is uh, memory stream. So you're looking here, memory stream .read async. Um, if you've played with the async CTP at all, you might have noticed there's read async, write async, these kind of extension methods that were provided on streams. Um, you know, in this case, in .NET 4.5, when you're playing with the developer preview, we've actually added read async as a real method that's on the base stream type that's virtual that other streams can choose to override to provide efficient ways to interact with them asynchronously. Um, but a memory stream is a really special kind of stream. It's a stream that's backed by an array. So all the data is available in memory. Any operation we'd want to perform, it's going to be far cheaper to just go take the data off the shelf and hand it to you than spin up any sort of async infrastructure and figure out when to come back. Just take the data and return it. So what we'd really want to do uh, is write a read async implementation that looks like this. Um, you know, we'll be polite and say the cancellation token comes in. If, if cancellation was requested, we'll you know, throw. That's fine. But the meat of the method is that next uh, line. We're going to just call the synchronous read on the memory stream. right? Someone's asking to read async. We've already got the data. We'll just delegate to the synchronous method and um, return the result there, package it into a task, and hand it off. So you know, this is going to be reasonably efficient. We're avoiding most of the allocations. We're not going to go off and do more stuff here. But um, you know, we're still going to be taking some time to actually create that task. Every time somebody calls in here, we're going to have to create it. Um, and so the framework's not going to be able to cache this because, you know, this task of int, I think we cache um, int when it's a 0, 1, 2, or 3, some certain common ones, but you're going to have some arbitrary size here. And you look at where this is used, right? This is going to start to become high traffic code in your app. Um, you know, you're going to basically set up a buffer of some size and you're going to loop and you're going to say, all right, read from my memory stream and write to the buffer and process it. You know, read, write, read, write. And you're going to be chunking the data and passing it along. And so you're going to probably call read a whole bunch. If your file is a gigabyte, you might call it thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. So this is something we want to be fast. But the one thing we notice here is that, well, buffer length is always the same. Um, the thing that this method returns, the int, is how many bytes were read. Uh, and so if we're always passing in the same buffer length, in this case it's 4K, right? So we pass in 4K and say read 4K worth of bytes. Well, you know, over and over and over again, hundreds of thousands of times, this method's going to return 4K and tell us that's what was read. Only the very last time when we get to the end and there's that little set of dangling bytes that didn't quite round off to 4K, then we're going to return something else. But the 99.99% of the time before that, we're always returning the same thing. So 
This is sort of domain knowledge for this API. We know, hey, we kind of wish we could cache this particular task, the one that's like a task event that returns 4K synchronously. Um, and so we can actually go do that. So if you look at an alternate implementation for read async, it could look like this. And you notice it's no longer an async method. It has the same signature, it returns task event, but it now has a synchronous implementation. And you know, we're doing some kind of check at the beginning. We're saying, you know, hey, if the cancellation token had cancellation requested, we've got to jump through some more hoops to make ourselves a task that's going to be set to cancel. We don't have the async method infrastructure helping us, but it's not too complicated. But once we get past that, you can see that we then have this core logic here. Uh, and this is doing that kind of analysis. It's saying, all right, well, go ahead, read the bytes synchronously, and see how many were read. Um, if the number of bytes read is actually equal to the result of the last task we just saw, uh, the last time somebody called us, then on this stream, go ahead and just return that cached task. Um, otherwise, cache the task. You see we're holding it in M last task. Uh, make a new task from the result, from numread, uh, and then cache that. So if you see 4,000, 4,000, 4,000 like that, this is going to just find that task and directly return it. And you're not going to have to think about um, generating a new task manually. Only that very last time when it's going to be a different number is another task going to be created. So reading a stream of any size should amount to a total of two tasks, no matter how large it is. So let's see the difference this can make in practice. I'm going to come out here and see, I'm going to go back to my program. I'm going to go to the read async example. Oops. I'm going to dig into read async.run and take a look. And we see that we're tracking, we're going to track something slightly different here. We're going to track GCs. So we're tracking you know, Gen 0, Gen 1, and Gen 2 garbage collections. We're going to use this as a proxy for the performance that we have. And uh, you know, we're going to take a look at two different implementations. Memstream 1 is that simple method we saw. It's an async uh, task event method. It just basically calls the synchronous read and packages into a task automatically. That's what the async infrastructure does for you. Uh, in the case of Memstream 2, this is the task event version, but it doesn't uh, use async. It's using, uh, sort of exploding the method out manually so that we can manually cache that task because, because this is this high traffic code that we have. We're going to call into it thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. Um, so this is what we saw on the slides. We're going to go here. And so I'm now going to run this code. Oops. I guess we still have this running. Hold on. Rebuild here. So we're going to be running now against memory stream one. Uh, and so it's going to go out. And again, this is the one that's implemented using async. And it did this a whole bunch of times. And that ended up triggering 138 uh, Gen 0 garbage collections and one Gen 1 and one Gen 2. And then when we have memstream 2, the one that's caching the tasks, that's preventing that last allocation each time through. And so we see there were actually no garbage collections that occurred that entire time. And so in practice, if this is part of an app and the app is doing other things and wants to stay responsive, Avoiding these garbage collections uh, really helps keep the rest of your app uh, optimally responsive. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, does this, does this mean something that I have to manage myself? Is this something I have to think about uh, when using memory stream? Do I have to roll my own here? And no. Um, given that we're giving this talk, we actually did think of this. Uh, and so if we put um, this into memory stream, and I replace memstream2 with the actual .NET 4.5 memory stream that ships, you'll see that uh, memstream1 is going to go, and it'll have a very similar number of GCs uh, that it triggers. Um, but now when we get to memory stream, it's going to do a very similar um, kind of thing. It's going to avoid all these allocations and not uh, actually cause any garbage collection. All right, so go back to the slides. The lesson here is if you have domain knowledge about the kind of tasks you're creating uh, for a given high traffic API, uh, it may pay to go manually cache those tasks if you know you're very often going to have these already completed, synchronously completed tasks, um, and that's where you're going to get this. Now, you're not going to burn through one million tasks if they're not synchronously completing almost immediately, right? Assuming you're actually downloading 
a thousand pages from the internet, each of these pages is actually going to have to go do a network request. And so even if you have a lot of these requests going on, your bottleneck there is the actual speed of the slow thing that you're doing. So in those environments, none of this matters. Don't think about caching tasks. Write your async methods the most natural way possible, and your life will be fine. It's only when you're really optimizing in these cases where you're trying to squeeze back to the synchronous perf for something you're doing hundreds of thousands of times is sort of that, uh, that, that metric, right? That's when you want to start thinking about this. And, you know, it also pays sometimes to think about what are you caching, right? So you could also directly cache the tasks that you're generating for a given operation, right? Consider some sort of async method here. Um, you know, get contents async. You give it a URL, it returns you back the contents by going through HTTP client and getting something. Um, you know, that's fine, you get it. There's an extra concern here where we're saying, all right, we're going to make a dictionary, and as somebody requests something from us, um, if we've already seen that URL, we're going to pull it out of the dictionary, we're going to pull out the string and return that. And so this is fine, we're caching our string data. Again, the slow thing here is likely to be uh, the web downloads, right? But if you're heavily relying on this cache in your app for performance, maybe you have 100,000 different places you know, over the course of a minute that are going to need this data. And whichever one happens to be first makes this async, but then the rest of the time you want this to complete synchronously and just give you the data. In that case, you really want this cache to be as fast as it can possibly be. Uh, and in that case, again, you have this kind of GC overhead. You're saying, you know, return contents inside an async method, that's going to make this task. Uh, and it's going to make a new one every time you call it, even though it's already completed. You have it cached. Every time you call this, it's going to be the same task with the same cached string. Um, but you're going to have to regenerate it each time. So what you really should be caching here is not the string. Go ahead and cache the task of string. You know, what we see here is I have the core logic down there in get contents async internal. That's doing my actual download. And because that's an async method, it naturally returns a task of string. But then in my outer method, which is what the user's calling, I, I made that a wrapper. I made it non-async. And then when somebody calls that, I implement my cache logic there. If I haven't seen the URL yet, I go and call my internal method to go ahead and get it and get the task that's going to give me that string. But if I have seen it, I pull the task that I stored last time, which is already completed. It finished um, from the previous time that I did it. And I can now give that task of string to anybody that's expecting me to give them a task of string. And it funnels that data through. So let's see what the difference is here between caching strings and caching tasks. I'm going to go back to the demo and go to program.cs here. Uh, we're going to explore this dictionary caching scenario. So I'm going to dig in, and it's really the same kind of idea again. Um, we're going to do this a whole lot. We're going to do it 10 million times. So if someone's hitting your cache 10 million times pretty quickly, you better make sure it's an efficient cache. Um, and then you see here I'm setting up two dictionaries, one that's going to cache strings and one that's going to cache task of strings. So the first one here, this is that Simple logic we saw, it's just the most straightforward caching logic, um, and what it returns to you is the string from the string cache. And we see get contents to async um, is actually just caching uh, the tasks. We see we didn't actually need an internal method here, we're just going to directly cache the tasks that come back from download string task async. It's already a task of string, we might as well just cache that. And so that's that difference. So what are we returning? Are we returning the task or are we returning um, the string and having it wrapped for us? So if we run this, it's going to go out. And we see that in the case where we cached the strings, we did this 10 million times. It's still pretty respectable. We did it 10 million times, and it took two seconds. Um, but in the cases where we're directly caching the task, we can cut that overhead in half. So we're down to one second then. Right? So there is you know, a non-trivial overhead to generating 10 million task objects and dealing with the garbage collections from 10 million you know, objects of garbage that we have to burn through uh, when we can actually avoid that by caching the task and continuing to give back the same reference object. So the core lesson here is if you're building one of these high traffic caches, uh, if you can, uh, and if this is an asynchronous method, go ahead and cache the task of tResult instead of caching the tResult and continuously generating a task every time. Um, if your cache is hit a lot, this could make a big perf difference and speed up your cache. So 
one thing that's worth talking about here uh, when we think about how async works you know, under the covers, there's this idea of a synchronization context. Uh, and a synchronization context sounds weird and scary. It's actually really just a target for work. Uh, it's a place that you can put uh, an operation, some delegate that you want to have executed, uh, and have it scheduled appropriately for whatever environment you're in. Um, and usually, the synchronization context is treated in a very ambient way, just by virtue of using a UI stack or being in some sort of uh, event handler. You have this ambient synchronization context to think about. So for Windows Forms, you have a Windows Forms synchronization context. And if you post something to it, this is this common method that lets you give it a delegate. Uh, it's actually going to pass that along to controlled up again invoke, the way you dispatch things to Windows Forms. If you have WPF, and I say dispatcher synchronization context, that's the ambient context I'd have there. Post is going to do dispatcher.begin invoke. Uh, and then you think of ASP.NET. ASP.NET's an interesting case. When I have an ASP.NET uh, web request that comes in, I'm going to be dealing with all sorts of different requests and you know, uh, switching threads and dealing between those. Uh, but when I'm dealing with a given request, I want to ensure that all of the scheduling I do occurs in order. I don't want more than one of these things to be processing for that request at the same time, or these things could stomp on each other. So it has a special synchronization context that lets stuff run in parallel, but only lets one operation execute that pertains to a specific request at once. It'll hold the other operations that are queued until that thing is finally done. And if you look throughout the .NET framework, you basically have about 10 of these for various purposes throughout the framework, plus you know, any other stack that people make, whether it's a UI stack or a server stack. Anyone else can make a sync context, make it ambient, and the right thing will happen here. And so when you're actually saying await task, you've probably heard us say, oh, well, when you await something, we always put you back into the same context where you were. We put you back where you started. Like, you're able to continue doing UI operations just the same as you did beforehand. And synchronization context is the key way that that happens. Um, if you're awaiting a task, by default, we're going to schedule that delegate, that continuation, which goes to the rest of your method. We're going to post that back to the synchronization context that we saved before the await. If you don't have one, if you're in a console app or something, we're going to do task scheduler. Uh, we're going to just schedule this off. Um, if you've set up a TPL task scheduler, uh, if you haven't, if nothing is available, we just go and run it in the thread pool. But if you're writing a UI app and doing event handlers, which is one of the core scenarios for async, you'll have a Windows Forms context, uh, WPF context, uh, WinRT context if you're targeting Win8 and doing XAML there. So for application level code, this behavior of coming back to where you started every time you do a wait is almost exclusively what you're going to want. Um, there's almost never a case where you don't want to come back to where you were because you're you know, performing some operation. You need to be able to continue to modify the UI. You want to come back there. However, if you're writing a reusable library, especially one of these high traffic libraries, it turns out this behavior is almost never what you want. Uh, because you really probably want to stay in the most efficient way possible within your library and let whoever's awaiting you be the one that bothers to put you back on the UI thread. You only need to do that once before the user's code continue exec continues executing. It's not worth doing it over and over again. So this was a design point that we had when designing async. We had to pick one of these sides. And we've erred on the side of application code, right? Uh, we expect that there's going to be more application developers out there than those developing reusable libraries. Uh, and also, the negative consequences uh, for the application developer are more dire. In certain cases, you can get into deadlocks. You can um, have sort of more extreme issues happen. For library authors, it's mostly limited to a perf issue. So the way we help get library authors who are thinking about this kind of issue and who notice a perf issue with their code, the way we get them out of this state uh, is offering configure await. And this is something you can call if you're writing a library to say, all right, I'm deciding whether I actually do want to go get posted back to this captured synchronization context. The default is true, so you're going to get posted back. That's the behavior you're used to. But if you pass false, then we avoid capturing that context. We just know, hey, we're going to call this. When we're done, wherever that happens to complete, that's fine. If I'm doing some file I.O., I'm going to come back on some sort of Windows I.O. completion port. And that's some random thread, but that's fine, because if the next thing I'm about to do is further file I.O., then I don't actually care about being on the UI stack. I'm still deep in some library method. There's nothing about um, the UI thread that I care about. I'm just going to be performing more processing. So the great implication here is that uh, we have better performance. We avoid unnecessary thread marshalling. 
you know, thread marshalling is non-trivial, and jumping back and forth between the UI thread and some background thread that's completing some operation I did is going to increase my overhead here. Um, you know, and there's also this certain side benefit that's tricky to talk about, but it's about deadlocks and how if my, and we'll explore this in a bit, but if the person who's calling me is doing certain things they shouldn't do, if they're synchronously blocking their UI thread, waiting for my async method to complete, um, they could end up causing deadlocks in their code. Uh, and if I actually, in my library, use configure await, um, you know, it's not going to make the app responsive. It's still going to be hung, but it's going to avoid that kind of deadlock. We'll see how that works. So let's actually test out how configure await works. We'll go back to our code here. Uh, I'm going to go back out of this example. And we're going to talk about um, capturing context here. Um, and if I look in here, you see that I have sort of just the simple WinForms app that I'm pulling together, just using WinForms because it's quick and easy to get something up and running in code versus thinking about designers. Uh, and I'm using it because we want some sort of ambient sync context. By being inside a button click handler from WinForms, we're going to have this ambient WinForms sync context around. Um, and you see I'm calling two methods, with sync context and without. With sync context here, I'm calling task.run, and then I'm immediately awaiting it. I'm just going to get the default behavior. This is going to post back to whatever sync context I started on. I came in synchronously from the UI thread. It's going to put me back there. Without sync context, is doing the same operation. But when we await it, we're now passing in that false flag. We're saying, hey, don't bother to put me back on the captured context. Just can leave me off wherever I happen to be. This is going to end up in the thread pool somewhere. And so I'm going to just go through, and I'm going to await both of them. And if I run this. I go ahead and run it here, and we see there's actually a huge difference in this case, right? So from doing this, let's see how many times we actually did this. Um, it's 20,000 iterations. From doing this, you know, a reasonable number of times, you know, there's a 17x difference, right? Doing 20,000 unnecessary thread switches is going to bog down your app if it's not something you want to do. Now, you're going to probably have trouble getting to 20,000 of these if you're just writing some UI logic, if you're downloading you know, 20,000 files, it's probably going to occur more slowly than half a second. You're not going to be able to kick off that many network requests that quickly. Uh, but, you know, in this case, I'm doing something that's, you know, maybe a background operation, some tasks that I'm putting in the thread pool. And these might be very small things. And if I know I'm dealing with a lot of little small things like that in the library half of my app, then I want to start thinking about configure await. I want to start thinking about, um, you know, opting out of this automatic um, putting back of my, uh, my context back into the UI thread where I was until I'm ready, until I actually get all the way back out to my event handler. So if we go back to the slides, we can explore the other half. I mean, the, the performance half that you're looking at here, it's pretty obvious. We want to avoid thread switches. But let's think about this deadlock scenario. So you imagine you're writing this library, you know, either it's something you ship or it's you know, a library component of a big enterprise app. And uh, the idea is you're making this async method, whoever's calling you, the app, the code that's calling you, should be awaiting you. That's the proper way for this event handler to be dealing with it. Um, but let's say instead of awaiting you, they're calling do work async dot wait. You know, this is the right way to do it, and this is going to be the wrong way to do it. The task dot wait method is the existing .NET 4.0 wait method. And it just means, hey, synchronously block my current thread until this task is done. So instead of relinquishing the UI thread, we're actually going to hold on to it and prevent any UI messages from pumping until this thing is done. You know, maybe there's some reason to do that if you can guarantee this thing is going to complete very fast, but you probably don't want to. So, but let's see what happens if the user does this. So they call do work async on the UI thread. They then go, when they're inside do work async, inside this async task method, and they schedule something to go happen in the thread pool, some sort of work. Um, now we get to the await, and the, this await here inside the library code is, you know, it wasn't marked with configure await, so it's going to capture the sync context. And it's hooking up the continuation to run when this completes. And that continuation is going to know to go do this kind of scheduling back. So now, back in the user app, you know, the person who called me called dot wait. And so this means the UI thread is now going to block waiting for do work async to actually return its task, to actually, or not to return the task, but for that return task to ultimately complete. So now the task.run we had over there finally completes. It completes on the, th on the thread pool. 
and it's going to invoke its continuation, say, all right, well, let's go put our continuation back on the UI thread. Unfortunately, the user is waiting on the UI thread for you to complete, so the UI thread is actually never going to become available. And so that means that do work async can't actually finish running. It can't get past that await because do work async wants to finish its job on the UI thread also. And so we now have a deadlock. Each method is now waiting for the other one to give up control of the UI thread. So yet another reason not to do that uh, in your app code. But let's say that the user does. Now, if I change this over here on the right, like you look at the way the code was, if I, in my library code, add dot configure await false, I'm now saying, you see things that are crossed out, I'm not capturing the synchronization context anymore. I'm simply saying, go ahead, run this, and wherever you come back, that's where my method is going to continue executing. And when you do that, it means that, well, as we go through here, you get all the way back out to step six, and you know, I'm still waiting there, but do work async was actually able to continue executing in the thread pool. It got all the way to the end. It finished that. The task it returned is now marked as being complete, and that means that the wait on that task can now be done, and so the app can continue running. And so by us being a good citizen and doing configure await within our library, people who do questionable things with the tasks that we return can potentially avoid deadlocks. And if they really seem to know what they're doing and they can slice this very finely and they do want to actually block for some reason, we could end up enabling that uh, for our, our library consumers. Um, so actually, let's just take a look at what this looks like. If we go back here, we'll just go back to the same example. And you know, down here, instead of saying with sync to, uh, wait, 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 uh, wait with sync context, I'm going to say with sync context dot wait. So now I'm calling. Oops, I'm calling that same method now. Sorry, I'm calling the same method I was awaiting, but I'm now calling the dot wait method. Uh, and if I run my app now, we see that you know it starts off responsive, but oops, see now suddenly I can't even drag the window anymore, right? So this would be expected. If I'm blocking the UI thread, I can't interact with the UI. But it's actually worse than that. Not only can I not interact with it, even after two seconds when that should be done, I still actually can't interact with it because this deadlock is not going to be resolved. And in fact, Windows gets very angry at me, and it's not even letting me close this. So I'm actually just going to go in here and um, go here and crash uh, this process because I ran it without debugging. So all right, well. That's not quite what we want. We want our app to avoid uh, deadlocking. So you know, obviously, we should probably put the await back in. But let's say we want to enable this type of thing. Um, if I go back up to with sync context here, you see, all right, um, I'm awaiting t. What if I go ahead and do that same thing? I say await t dot configure await, and I pass false. This is that continue on captured context parameter. So now we're going to be able to keep looping here inside with sync context. We're not going to be waiting for the UI thread to be relinquished. We'll just complete all this stuff on a background thread and then finally go back. And so I'm going to run this again. Uh, I run it. I hit the Run button. Um, actually, completed very fast, so it's hard to see. Um, let me amp up the number of iterations here. Uh, oops, run this without debugging, sorry. I hit Run, and you see that, oh, well, it's still running very fast, but you can get the idea. As I'm actually able to move the window, the window would be hung for a second, and I wouldn't be able to move it. So we're not fixing the user's uh, dumb move to actually go wait that. Uh, while they're waiting on the UI thread, the app's not going to be responsive. Um, but it actually gives it an ultimate path where the app could recover. And so you at least get an app that hangs for a second versus an app that deadlocks and that you have to crash in order to resume. So the lesson here is that if you're a library implementer, if you have this kind of high traffic code, use configure await. It helps you improve performance, uh, especially if you're going to have you know, some number of thousands of thread switches. You want to avoid that. Uh, and it can also potentially help avoid deadlocks for your users, although sometimes your users are probably not doing quite the best thing uh, in the cases where they'd hit such deadlocks anyway. So one other kind of context, we were talking there about uh, synchronization contexts. There's a different kind of existing context called execution context. And what this does is it flows across these kind of, um, you can think of them as logical points of asynchrony, places where one flow of control is kicking off some sort of other flow of control. Uh, and in these kind of environments, if there's ambient state in my app, 
that pertains to my flow of control. I want to kind of flow that naturally into that environment. And um, well, before we look at this, like you think of the kind of thing security context. And one famous one that you often think about for this is um, user impersonation, right? So if a user authenticates and now I want my app to behave on behalf of them, then you know, I have that as an ambient state. Whenever I'm doing operations, I'm going to perform in the security context of that user. But if I spin off a thread, I want that thread's operations to also perform in the context of that user. So I need to flow this idea of this logical security context over from one side to the other so it, it persists. And the places where we do that today are things like existing things that have existed forever, things like new thread, threadpool.quser work item, uh, the new stuff we're adding for task.run, that's basically a, a new way to put stuff in the thread pool with, with less code. Um, any of the begin foo methods, the begin foo end foo kind of pairs would also take care of flowing this execution context for you. Uh, and we've made await tasks that it will flow execution context um, because it's important that we don't uh, give up on this just because you know, we're scheduling a callback. If you're impersonating a user, you want that to flow properly uh, across awaits. But the COR in many places, you know, some related to the async uh, language feature and some not, is very heavily internally optimized for this idea of a default context, one where you haven't stored any such state. So really, if you're trying to get the best performance out of your app, you want to avoid using these kind of logical call context um, oper uh, objects to go store things, right? It's a convenient way to store ambient state, but often there's another way that you can go about it. Um, maybe you can store some sort of static app globals, things like that, um, associate something in a uh, hash you can associate with some request rather than making it some sort of pseudo thread local you know, related to that request. Uh, it's better for you to find an alternate way to do that because you're going to save a lot of perf when you're doing asynchronous operations. Uh, you know, one example here is if you've used Correlation Manager. You know, mucking with the activity ID here, uh, that's actually stored. It's going to call logical set data on call context to uh, go and modify this and set some ambient state. And that means you're going to get into this background or this uh, slow path. Uh, and that's what you want to avoid. Now, you know, obviously, if you have to impersonate a user, you, you have to do that. And so definitely do the thing that you need to do um, uh, semantically for your app if that's required. But you want to kind of think of alternate ways to avoid this. And so if we want to see the perf impact this would have, we can go to this demo here. Uh, and we'll see that we're looping 100,000 times. And uh, in this case, we're basically setting uh, logical set data. So we're setting some key called foo, um, and it's going to have the value bar. And this is something we could ambiently look up now, um, and it's going to be flowed for us. And we, we do our stopwatch here. And then when we're done, we free that slot. So it's no longer there. And this reverts the CLR back to that uh, quick path that it has when there's no such context that needs to flow, and it can just assume default context. So we're going to do um, one time with context, one time without. Uh, and if we run it, we see that there's quite a difference here. So you have this kind of 5x perf impact if we have to go through this flow path that has to think about how it's flowing this context uh, across these boundaries. So you know, the lesson here is really, if you can avoid it, if you don't need this ambient state for what you're doing, um, you, know, you can try to avoid it. And you know, yet again, this is over 100,000 operations. If you were doing impersonation and you did like 10 awaits, you would not notice the difference here. But um, in these kind of library cases, you know, or even in an app, if you know you're operating on a lot of data, try to look for alternatives here. So don't sabotage the CLR's built-in optimizations. Avoid execution context if that's possible. And so sort of the last thing I want to show is um, something that relates to how the me mechanism that underlies async actually deals with locals. We call this lifting. Um, it's something we do generally in the compiler when you have closures, uh, when you have one scope that has like a lambda, and that lambda needs to refer to variables that are in that outer scope. Uh, the lambda may be executed when that method has moved on. And so the variables that it captures from that outer context have to be lifted into the heap. Um, so we do that kind of stuff today for lambda expressions to move things that you see as local variables out into the heap. But when you do asynchronous methods, well, 
a lot of these variables could still be referenced you know, after an await point. And recall that when you get to an await point, the benefit of async is you're getting entirely off the call stack. Um, you're relinquishing control of your thread, so your locals can't just sit there and persist as stack locals because they're going to be removed when you actually get to your first await. So it means that we need to move these locals up into the heap. Um, so they need to survive su suspensions. The way we do this is we have that state machine type. It's custom generated for every async method that you have. And so on that type, we stash the locals. So for each local you have, we're going to generate a field. So think of this method foo async here. Um, let's say I'm defining two locals. One DTO is a date time offset and another date time local. I'm getting the now uh, offset. I'm then or pulling apart its date time, and I'm going to move on. So I'm using two locals to do this. But this is going to turn into two fields on that state machine, one that maps to each one of these locals. So you know, if you avoid unnecessary locals, excuse me, excuse me, if you're able to combine these together, that can now eliminate one of the locals that we were going to emit into the state machine. Now, it says currently here because you know, this is the kind of compiler optimization that we could end up making, right? You know, we could ultimately at some point say, all right, well, we know that DTO is not crossing async boundaries. Um, you know, for the releases that are out there now and you know, potentially for this release, we don't think we're going to get to that kind of thing. Um, but you know, this is some sort of future optimization you could imagine um, inside the compiler where we could start to get smarter about this kind of thing. But in the meantime, what you want to do is inside your async methods, again, remember, it's about shrinking the size of these heap objects, these unavoidable heap objects, to reduce the number of GCs. So you know, if possible, try to reduce the number of locals you have um, in your async methods. Now, again, this is not to make you paranoid and try not to code properly in async methods. If you analyze your app, if you find you have a perf impact in a particular async method, this kind of thing is something you could examine. Uh, and so we'll take a look. Um, we'll take a look at a demo, and we'll actually just see the kind of impact this is here. I'm going to go in here, um, and you know we see that we have basically some silly methods here, but ones that kind of make our point. We have one here, foo one. This is now going to go and you know get date time dot now, and it's going to add one second to it, and continue yielding back control to the thread. Uh, the UI thread, or in, in this case, I'm just going to yield to the thread pool. It's going to insert this point of asynchrony uh, here, where we're going to have to resume. And you know, each time we actually get back from the await, we're going to be dealing with a new local variable, right? So this is sort of the worst case scenario, right? This is something where um, you know I have to ha deal with all these different variables. They're crossing these await boundaries. Uh, and then only ultimately do I finally put this back um, into A and you know, potentially do something else with it. I contrast this with foo2, which is mostly the same code, except that I keep reusing the variable A. I'm not making new variables. So I only have one local. I'm not making like 10, 15 locals. So you know, I'm going to call into each of these and see how long it takes. I'm going to close this. I'm going to rebuild. I'm going to run this. And you, know, you see, you know, it's a modest difference. So for me dealing with this one particular method and changing the locals I have, it had a 10% perf impact. right? So you know, again, this one is more of a modest change. It's not something where you should go out and sort of, oh, I have you know, 10 locals and they're all ints. I'm going to have some complicated scheme for using all the ints in my async method. It, it's not something you want to do everywhere, but you know, if you have, again, one of these high traffic methods and 10% could be meaningful to you in some case, it's worth examining what you could do there. Um, you know, really, again, that general principle is don't go through these contortions until you've run your perf tests and measured your app, and you realize that a given method is actually proving to be a bottleneck. Um, certainly, the uh, productivity benefits to you of having async methods uh, really kind of outweigh a lot of these perf concerns um, until you get to that high traffic scenario. So yeah, and when you think about why that happens, async method locals are now fields on that heap allocated class, more locals turn into more fields, which turn into bigger allocations. And bigger allocations mean more GCs, which can affect your perf. So in terms of takeaways um, and things to think about, uh, 
you know, we've done a lot with async methods, and really the core design of async methods is, for the most part, you get to think of them just like you think of synchronous methods. And this is what makes them wonderful to use. Um, and as part of the core team that designed async methods, um, I would hate to dissuade anybody from actually using them. So definitely go use async methods. They're going to make your application code far simpler to write. And even your library code, once you learn these tricks, will be way simpler to write. Um, the story there is that uh, we are looking at this kind of XML, our asynchronous XML API, and we've tried to think about how we'd implement such a thing before, and uh, even in the base class library, and it, you know, it wasn't worth the expense and the time it would take to flesh that out. Uh, with async, that kind of thing was very easy to create. Um, and we're able to use these tricks to make that very efficient. So definitely use async methods. Use it to build your apps. Um, use async methods to build your libraries. Again, they're going to be faster than you trying to do the asynchrony manually. But the one thing you want to keep in mind is the granularity of your async. If you find yourself calling async methods for individual bytes or doing something you're going to do millions of times, that's that kind of warning flag. So just take a step back and look, am I being too fine-grained? Should I chunk this up some more? Should I get a batch of data that's bigger and then operate on that batch synchronously? Um, you know, and if I do actually have to be that fine-grained, what can I do to speed that up if I do have to do something multiple times? So you know, the tricks we talked about today, um, cache tasks where it's applicable. You know, we had that one cache we were writing. You, know, that was, you could think of it as fine-grained async. We were calling it 10 million times, right? But once we actually started caching the tasks, that didn't matter. Uh, we were able to just continuously return the tasks. There's no allocations to speak of. Our, our cache becomes fast again. So make sure you're caching tasks rather than the things that uh, will have to be returned and will produce new tasks each time. Make sure you use configure await false when you're writing libraries to avoid unnecessary um, context switches back to the synchronization context. Let it be the outer app code that's awaiting you that, be, uh, that exists as the one place where it's going to actually do that marshalling back to the UI thread. It's better to do it there once rather than 10,000 times in one of your inner loops. Uh, avoid gratuitous use of execution context. If you have to use it, use it. If you don't, Try to find an alternate way to flow this kind of ambient state that your app needs to track. Your async methods will thank you. Uh, and the other key, if you really need to squeeze out that last 10% of perf uh, at the end, um, you can start to remove unnecessary locals. But I'd save that one for uh, emergencies. Um, and you know, that's it. So again, go off, explore with async, and hopefully this gives you an ability to squeeze out the perf in those cases where you're really using async at the heart of your application. Thanks.